Thank you. It's wonderful um, to be here. I mean, I do work here, uh, and it's nice to be in a, it's nice to be in a place where you feel like this is really a cool space to work. So um, you know, so thank you all for like cooling it up and all this other stuff. Uh, and I appreciate being someone who still uses the word cool. Okay, I'm never letting it go. That's right, okay. that's right, that's right. Uh, um, I, I just want to say a few words uh, before I introduce John Jennings, who will then introduce the speaker um, for, for this afternoon, uh, Stacy Robinson. The idea of the dream, the idea of dreaming for freedom, the idea of we can make it, it can happen, is something that is the foundation of the African American experience in the US. We actually believe things. And sometimes it's through speculation. Sometimes it's because we know that, you know, if you hear any noise, it's just me and the boys, okay? We know that it was all a dream means something to so many people. We know that if I ruled the world means something. And what is really, I think, beautiful is to see these ideas and these passions and what is so much at the heart of African American culture, to see it in such great hands. Uh, and throughout the country and throughout universities and throughout garages and rooms and folks sitting in front of screens, we have so many people imagining what that looks like in a way that's inclusive, in a way that keeps us on our toes because the idea is, is about how we represent creates our future. And our words and our language and our music and our art creates our future. All of those things do that. And so I've learned that doing the Hip Hop Archive. I've learned that in order for it to be an archive that actually supports, reflects the hip hop culture, there has to be room for all these dreams and all these possibilities, and there has to be the science behind it and the work, the hard work behind it and the love behind it. So it, uh, when I say it's a great pleasure to, to do this, I obviously am someone who imagined a future. Now, the future that we're seeing is really much more colorful and imaginative than ones that I used to come up with. Uh, but in the end, it's all about freedom and, and, and um, a voice in a place. And so my introduction of John Jennings is really a celebration of what I consider to be a major movement that's been happening uh, in, in, in the sciences and the arts for a long, long time. Uh, John Jennings is, so I'm gonna do first the regular read and so that um, those of you who don't know who he is will get a sense from an academic perspective who he is and then um, a, a little bit about who he is um, in other ways as well. So John Jennings is Professor of Media and Cultural Studies at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, he received his MA in Art Education uh, in 95 and the MFA in Studio with the focus on Graphic Design in 97 at University of Illinois Urbana. Uh, he's an inter interdisciplinary scholar who examines the visual culture of race in various media forms, including film, illustrated fiction and comics, and graphic novels. Uh, he's also a curator, graphic no uh, editor, and design theorist whose research interests include the visual culture of hip hop, Afrofuturism and politics, visual, li visual literacy, horror, and the ethnogothic and speculative design and its application to visual rhetoric. So I'm one of those people that don't do horror. I, 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 I do freedom. Okay, and at the end of every every imaginary moment, we're victorious. You know, so you know what can I say? Um, 
He's co-editor of the Eisner Award-winning collection, The Blacker, uh, The Ink, Constructions of Black Identity in Comics and Se Se Sequential Arts, and co-founder, organizer of the Schomburg Center's Black Comic Book Festival in Harlem. He's co-founder and organizer of the MLK Nor uh, Cal's Black Comics Arts Festival in San Francisco, and also SoulCon, the Brown and Black Comics Ex Expo at the Ohio State University. Uh, his projects has also, have also included Included the graphic novel adaptation of Octavia Butler's Kindred with Damien Duffy, uh, Tony Medina's police brutality themed ghost story I Am Alfonso Jones with Stacey Robinson, and his hoodoo noir graphic novella Blue Hand Mojo. Um, he's also was also two years ago a Nasir Jones hip hop fellow uh, here at the Hutchins Institute, and during that time his project was a mind-blowing experience for all of us, those of you who remember there, because we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know what he was going to do. Uh, he kept talking about trap, and at that time, trap was really big, and for those of you who don't know, it has to do with, at, at the, let me just say it's a southern form of hip hop, but if you think about something called a trap, coming out of the South, you have to go, oh, it's going to be bad, okay? Uh, and and so um, so he, the name of it was Remixing the Trap, Race Space in the Speculative South. And what he did, and just to give you a short description of what he did, he, um, well, I'll, I'll read from here. He blew our minds as he shared his creation and design of the black Southern hip hop influenced cyber trap. Uh, with this collaborative narrative world and its narrative parameters, its characters, and producing stories that take place within this space. The goal is to develop an exhibition in our book that explores the underpinnings of a new science fiction performative subgenre and its usefulness as a method of analysis and celebration of the Black South. Uh, is sometimes contentious place in the psyche of the collective unconscious of the American mind. Um, and one of his major partners in that conception was and continues to be Stacy Robinson. So he created a, the trap future speculative world for the South. And the images, the connections, the possible stories herald back to basically this notion that our imaginations are in fact in good hands. And uh, it's my pleasure right now to introduce you to those good hands, John Jennings. Thank you. Thank you. I love the humility that Marcy has. I work here. You are this, man. I mean, anyway, so uh, thank you for that intro. And thank you. Um, uh, to be, uh, it's so wonderful to be sur surrounded by so, so many amazing scholars and uh, feels good to be in one of my intellectual homes. So thank you so much for that. Um, it's, gonna, it's, it's, it's hard. I had to write this intro. It's very short and it's very... Um, the gym I'm about to in introduce uh, is someone that I, I love and respect deeply. So it's, it was extremely difficult to write an uh, intro for Stacey Robinson. And I kind of talk about this. It should be easy to do an introduction for, for the amazing scholar and artist we're about to listen to. For almost a decade, as the artistic avatar Black Kirby, we've generated literally thousands of pieces of art together and given scores of talks about our process, our work, and our artistic inspirations. But then I was stuck because I know so much about this brother and his work and his processes. Um, we have so much in common and, and, you know, as far as like stories and things that we're working on. So it gave me pause. What can I say about this brother, and where do I start? Wait, I'm trying to introduce you, man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Sometimes when you're stuck on a piece of writing, you just go back to the key terms that you're dealing with. You go back to the definition, the DNA of the idea. So. Stacy, from the Greek, his name means fruitful, productive, resurrection, on. one who will be reborn. Come on now. Mm. Uh -uh. He's also a great amen corner. Definitions can save us sometimes because let me tell you, this man has been fruitful. He made so many sacrifices for his ac academic work, his family, his vision, and his fellow man. 
Any student fortunate enough to be under his watchful eye has received a blessing that they probably don't even realize yet. He has been incredibly productive and has already created an intellectual and pedagogical legacy that in only a few short years. His work is already taught and studied around the world, and he's just getting started. I personally watched his intellectual and spiritual resurrection, watching him start the fire, contemplate the pain of the flames, and then enter into it anyway. Because on the other side, he knew that he was going to be reborn. He knew that he'd be a more efficient, effective, loving, a brand new entity, a phoenix. A phoenix is a mythical bird that rises from its own ashes. This burning and resurrection is part of its life cycle. It literally remixes itself to get to a higher level. It's part of its growth. I feel that it's an apt description as any for this wonderful human being that I'm about to give the lectern up to. Except he's not a myth. He's real. And he's one of the realest you'll ever meet and one of the most incredible souls I've ever had the, the fortune to, to encounter. <clears throat> Sorry. Because <laughs> he's my student, too. So. It's my honor, privilege, and utter joy to introduce you to my collaborator, my colleague, and my ally and brother, Professor Stacy Avian Robinson. <laughs> Jim, how do we get this back to the full screen? Mm -hmm. Where is it? Right there. Where's the slide show? Is it there? Mm -hmm. Right there. How do we get it back to the screen where we clicked it? Does this go right here? Maybe this will help review. Yeah, that's it. That's it? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Few technical difficulties. But um, perfect. 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 All right, cool, cool. We are we are rolling. All right. <laughs> All right. Wow, wow. I needed that because I did not need to be crying up here. Um, imagine your best friend and your collaborator, right? Introduces you. And that's the first time he's ever introduced me. Yeah, so this, oh, brother, thank you so much. Um, so really quickly, we're going to jump right into this because I want to make sure I stay on time and have to save time for Q&A. So building black utopias through looking at hip hop as a black speculative technology, right? Um, I always like to start here. There's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet. Come on, you know. You must be the one to write it. Right? That's what we're dealing with. So some of the things that I think about, I'm going to set up a, um, the premise of my work, how I think about it, drop a few definitions, the way that I think about it, not necessarily the exact definitions, um, but the way that I think about these definitions, right? So one of the things I like to think about is how racism and white supremacy have unfairly chosen the black, the black artist practice. Not necessarily our medium or the way that we, the way that we make work, but we are limited, I argue, in, the, in what we make because Black people were not brought here to be artists, mm -hmm. right? So anytime that we create artwork, it's in protest. Now, we can argue that, we could debate that, we could think about that. I could be totally wrong with that. I'm totally fine with that. My work is really about jumpstarting a conversation. It's not about me being right, right? So some of the things I'm going to talk about, utopia, the way that I think about utopia is not necessarily a perfect space of peace where everything is flawless. I actually think of it very opposite. I think of it as a place where black people go to to begin the conversations around defining our blackness outside of colonialism. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Sankofa is a Ghanaian term that means to go back and get it. As we are venturing into our Afro future, we need to purposely go back and get our, our history that's been erased, stolen, destroyed, et cetera. And then Afrofuturism. The way I think about Afrofuturism is futures where black people have agency to define our parameters. Sankofatopia is a term that I'm playing around with, with uh, which playing around with 
which looks at ideas of uh, Pan-Africanism across the diaspora, um, uh, Afrocentrism, and combining that with ideas of black speculative culture and thought. So in this presentation, I'm gonna be looking at hip hop and visualizing, and how I think about visualizing spaces of resistance as an art practice. I'm doing this through collage. So you'll notice if those of you are, if any of you are familiar with the work of Romare Bearden, for example, you will notice the influence of Romare Bearden in my work. It is intentional, right? I shout out my ancestral past and those who are with me now, for example, you'll see the influence of John Jennings in my work. I make no apologies about that, right? Um, it's important for me to shout out the, the, uh, the, the past and the present as we are venturing into creating our own liberated black Afro futures. Amen? We get that? Okay. So I just started preaching over here. <laughs> All right. So let me be very clear about how I think about utopia. I think that there, um, I'm going to walk around a little bit too. Excuse me. Um, the way that I think about utopia, I think that there, there's a few examples that I'm going to show. Um, that give you an idea how I'm beginning to think about this, right? This is an art practice that is really still in its infancy. So I think Wakanda is a perfect example of how I'm beginning to think about this. Wakanda is not a perfect space, but it's a very black, liberated space, I would argue. I look at the ancestral plane. How many of you saw the Black Panther movie? Because I'm referencing yeah. the Black Panther movie right now. Yeah. Right, the ancestral plane is a contentious space, right? Remember when T'Challa got up in his father's face? about his uncle, right? He said, yo, you left me to be king, I wasn't ready, and then you leave me with this? I'm not gonna drop any cuss words, mama. <laughs> I want you, I'm working on it. The Sam Jackson come out real quick, <laughs> real quick. But I'm also, looking at, I'm also looking at the complexities of a young king in love with a woman who is not ready to be married, right? Who has her own mission as she's freeing other Wakandans Right, one of my favorite scenes is where uh, uh, T'Challa shows up, like it's the first scene, one of the first scenes in the movie, and he interrupts her mission, right? And she's like, and Nakia's like, yo, what are you doing? I had this under control. And he doesn't even address that. He's like, I need you. My father died. <laughs> not gonna drop it, but it gets, <laughs> I, I draw some tears in the movie. I, not no, like no punk, I, I was like thug with it though. I cried. <laughs> 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 right? But there, there are so many complexities. So I even look at Nakia's laboratory as a utopian space, right, where she's building technology based on science and mysticism, et cetera, right? So what does, this, what do, what does our world look like, remixed by hip hop, thinking about sampling and remixing? What kind of worlds can we build outside of the influence of colonialism? This is what I'm looking at. But I'm also looking at, how many of you have seen the show Superstition on Sci-Fi Channel? Only one season, not a lot of people really watched it. I followed this, I really loved it. Um, Mario Van Peebles and his family. I'm not gonna tell you too much about it because I really want you to watch it. You can find it online. It's a really, really interesting show about a multi-generational black family who defends the world against um, demons who are trying to, to, to break into our world. Yeah like that. But it also deals with black families and reconciliation in a very interesting way. You have contentious relationships, romantic relationships, father-daughter relationships, father-son relationships, and their, res their resolution. I like to say, there's this expression I like to use, Wakanda starts at home. <laughs> it does. It really does. It really does. And think about the complexity of that. That might sound comical, but think about that, right? I'm also looking at how many of you are watching Black Lightning? How many of you are really paying attention to the, the complexity of the family relationships? This is black power for real, black superpowers, but black agency, contention, right, between siblings, between husband and wife, between father and daughter, father and wife, right, you see what I'm saying? But the resolution is what I'm looking at and very interested in, right? Even, even a young, um, you can see this image here, oh, excuse me, uh, of um, a young black lightning with his father, Jefferson Pierce with his father, who was killed or taken from him, which kind of sparks his genesis in a particular way. Not gonna give too much away on that. So, I'm a collage artist, I'm a, I draw, 
I paint, I can paint traditionally. I work, it's interesting because I'm trained traditionally as a graphic designer. And the way that I think about making the work and the way that I, I, I make work digitally because of the immediacy the, um, in which I have to get it out. As a graphic designer, how many of you have em ever employed a graphic designer before? Y'all know that y'all don't call on us in the beginning of the project. Y'all call <laughs> us at the end of the project. So you're like, yeah, right, that's exactly what we do. So working digitally allows me to get work done really, really quickly. But the way that I think about this piece, for example, in building Black Utopia is we're, we're sankofarating our past. We're going back, we're thinking about the contention in our past, but then we're pulling that into the Afro future so that we can build from it and, and, um, and build upon it. But I'm also thinking about the dystopia. I'm going to walk around a little bit because I see people looking around polls. Um, I'm looking at, for example, the Middle Passage and how the effects. How many of you know that great white sharks used to follow the slave ships? I want to drop it, mama, right? <laughs> as, as this woman is looking toward a pan-African Saturn, Saturn is representing Sun Ra, Stevie Wonder, et cetera, right? As she's looking toward this future that is beginning to shape, this past is creeping up on her, right? We got to take our, we have to take our contentions into the Afro future with us as we build it. Um, bunch, ha bunch happened in these pieces. I'm going to talk about one piece at a time. So how many of you know the history between Dr. King, all right, <laughs> and Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant O'Hara on Star Trek? She quit out. How many of you don't know that story? Okay, yeah, let me drop that. So really quickly, you can find this on YouTube as well. Um, she quit after the first season. Gave Gene Ronberry resignation letter. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm out. After some back and forth, uh, she decides to think about it for over the weekend. She goes to a, a, a party that night, and someone comes up to her and says, oh, excuse me, Miss Nichols, your number one fan is here to see you. Wait for it. She's like, oh, I would love to go meet my number one fan. Bring her over, and it's the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King who turns around. Ooh. Yeah, see, mama? Mm. Right? Imagine that, right? <laughs> so imagine, say, oh, my goodness, Dr. King, oh, my God, thank you so much. You're my number one fan. That's awesome. And then he says, you know, in my, my horrible Dr. King impression, you know, Coretta and I, we only <laughs> let our children stay up late on Wednesday night because you're on television. She's like, well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I just quit. Imagine Dr. King tells you, you cannot quit your job. Do you know what's happening in the civil rights movement? You are influencing the civil rights movement in a very particular way because you're the first black woman in space. Now, if you follow the, se um, the first generation of Star Trek, you know she was on for, for all six seasons and in the following movies. That's the influence, right? Popular culture affecting the civil rights movement and politics and vice versa. This is what I'm thinking about. I'm also looking at, um, John and I make a lot of projects. I'm going to go back and forth between our collaborations. Some of it's going to be collaborations. Some of it's going to be my work. So it's going to be, you're going to get, you're going to, it's like Timberly and, Mi and Missy. You're going to get, we so tight that you get a styles tangled. <laughs> right? You're going to see, we're going to go back and forth between what's collaborative and what's not. So this bow hop, I'm looking, and with this bow hop project, I'm looking at um, graphic design through the Bauhaus movement, but also looking at its limitations and what it does not speak to, right? Um, this is a project that John and I are working on. We're traditionally trained graphic designers, but we're, we're critical makers, and we're looking at critical race design studies um, as this way of examining um, what, how we think about work, how we think about graphic design, and how graphic design is not really meeting the needs of us. So these are just some images that are uh, thinking about graphic design and hip hop as design as well, because you have four elements, which is very modular, but together they make a fifth element, which I call not, which I consider to be knowledge. There are people who say that another element is a fifth element. I like to say it's knowledge. There's an an, a biannual conference called Planet Deep South that looks at black speculative culture through uh, southern-based imaginings. And these are images that I'm looking at, thinking about, thinking about what a, a pan-African um, um, Confederate flag looks like, you know, Afrofuturist Confederate flag, or the idea of the minstrel as an alien who's come to our planet as a means of survival that gives us a technology. 
John and I are Black Kirby. So for those of you who are not familiar, how many of you know who Jack Kirby is? Everybody in this room knows who Jack Kirby is. How many of you have seen the Avengers movie? Incredible Hulk, <laughs> Iron Man, Captain America, right? You, we all know Jack Kirby's work. Jack Kirby was the artist who, along with Stan Lee, created very, a lot of the Marvel Universe. As the Avengers movies are coming out, his name is being erased. John and I are having a discussion about this around 2010, 11 or so, and we're like, well, damn, they're, no, when, no 2012, because the Avengers movie is coming out in 2012. We're like, damn, they're treating this second generation Jewish immigrant, Jack Kirby, like he's black. Mm. So to call him Black Kirby. <laughs> and we start laughing, and it's like, oh, Oh, wait a minute, it's kind of genius. So, we <laughs> so in our eighth year as a collaborative duo, Jack, uh, Black Kirby, we're looking at um, remixing imagery inspired by Jack Kirby, um, using Jack Kirby's aesthetic to think about popular culture and comics, but also what popular culture and comics is not necessarily talking about, which is our, uh, our, our black contributions to world culture. Right, so for example of the type of work that we make, this Mo Blactus piece, um, how many of you know who the Galactus character is? Galactus is a Fantastic Four villain who eats planets. He's not a villain, he's not a bad guy at all actually, he just eats planets because he's hungry. That's what he does to survive. <laughs> well, he's a giant white man who does this. This is a particular commentary. He said, you are old. But imagine if this was a giant black man that comes to eat your planet. Yeah. Is he thugging? Is he gangster? What if that giant god that comes, he's a deity, actually, would, that's what he'd be considered, and eating the planet would be considered a recompense. But what if that black guy has gold teeth, quotes hip-hop, and uses hip-hop as verse in scripture, right? It becomes a different type of narrative. And then we, we imagine the unkillable buck as the Incredible Hulk, a giant, a white man, actually, a white doctor who changes when he gets aroused, et cetera, into a giant, unkillable black man, <laughs> right? Which is the Hulk in a particular way. How many of you remember, remember the Avengers movie uh, um, toward the end where, where the, um, Bruce David Banner, he's walking toward the monster, right? Remember uh, Iron Man says, I'm bringing a party to you? And he's walking toward the creature as in his human form. He says, you wanna know what makes me angry? Because they've been trying to make him Hulk out the whole movie. And he says, I'm always angry and immediately he turns around and hulks out. How many of you remember that scene? Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's like, yes. When I saw that, I cussed. I was like, that's the black experience. We angry all the time. I'm angry right now. <laughs> Seriously. I'm, I'm angry because I'm angry my mom won't let me drop. <laughs> you know, I got to get in sometimes. So we, uh, Marcy, thank you, Marcy. You talked about this cyber trap. Uh, we could talk about more of this later. The cyber trap as a southern space. Imagine um, a, a hurricane that decimates the south, right? It separates Louisiana, uh, Mississippi area from the rest of the continent. And in this, um, the residents have to come up with a new um, monetary system, new technologies, new ways of survival. I could, even though this may be considered a dystopia, I look at this as a utopia because of what we will be able to, get, to define. Does that make sense? So the way that I think about dystopia and utopia kind of gets itself tangled in a particular way as well. It's a space where we get to define our own present. This is a book that came out a couple years ago, Cosmic Underground, um, edited by Ronaldo Anderson and John Jennings. Um, in this, I made these uh, discursive um, um, diegetic prototypes that exist only in stories. So George Schuyler's uh, Barber Chair, for example, or P. Funk's Bop Gun, for example, right? And I'm imagining what these look like as real technologies that we could actually use to liberate ourselves. Um, I Am Alfonso Jones was mentioned as well. This is the first Black Lives Matters inspired graphic novel. And it's a magical realism story written by Tony Medina, illustrated by John James and myself. Shouts out to our other collaborator, Damian Duffy, who did the lettering and text design. Master Black is a series that I'm working on that looks at ideas of black abstraction. And, and I'm thinking about looking at, wondering, can black artists actually be non-objective artists? Can we make work that means nothing at all? Can I hang a blank white canvas on a wall 
and examine how the shadows affect that canvas throughout the day and how sound and atmosphere affect that canvas and make that an art piece or as an art practice. One of the things I have contention with is once again, I said before, black artists cannot be non-objective or uh, we cannot make art that is not political. I find myself in a constant failure with my own imagining, right? Even these pieces are very political. I'm, I'm trying to make them and they have all kinds of commentary um, um, in, inside of them. I, I consider it a failure, but I keep working at this. Virago Mandem is a project that John and I worked on with uh, choreographer Cynthia Oliver. And it's a multimedia performance uh, piece. It's a dance piece that is video, it's music, and it looks at black masculinity through the lens of Caribbean culture. My contribution to this project was I got 10 prompts from uh, Cynthia Oliver and she gave me one word prompts, thug, um, um, slave, metrosexual, etc. cetera, right? Um, dandy, right, et cetera. She gave me these, all these prompts and I, had to, I actually had to do some research because those one word prompts weren't as easy to execute as I thought. The hardest one I think that was really um, hard, hard for me to address was this one right here. The word geek, or nerd, pardon me, is the word nerd. And I was like, well, what is a nerd? How do we define, how do we think about nerd and geek, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's an entire movement of black, ne black geeks, black nerds, bleaks and blurs, right? There's a whole movement um, that is defining that. But when I looked at that and thought about how I wanted to execute this, it took me a while and I was like, oh, wait a minute. I literally looked to the side of me on the couch and there was my 18 year old. International artist, animator, theater major, at 18. This guy is killing it. He is the definition, the personification of geek and, blur and, and nerd, bleak and blurred. And he's a skateboarder, <laughs> parkouring and jumping off of stuff. I'm like, wait, son, no, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, dad, was, we were jumping, me and my friends, we were jumping off this building. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> but. What's interesting, what's interesting also about him is that he's a cosplayer. For those of you who are unaware, it means you dress up as particular characters and you perform in public. My son did this in high school. He would dress up, for those of you who know Dragon Ball Z and um, I forgot the other character, he would dress up as a black Goku, right? I used to call him Broku. <laughs> but he would get requests to come to school as a character, right? So now he actually travels. I took him to his first Comic Con last year, and he went as Miles Morales, Spider Man Miles Morales. And people were flocking him all weekend. At first, he was really shy. No, Dad, I don't want to take pictures. And I had to tell him, I'm like, son, they don't see Solomon Robinson. They see Miles Morales, their favorite superhero. After a while, I saw him come out in a way that I had never seen. He's up there posing, he's <laughs> taking pictures. It's beautiful. I got to see him emerge as a young performer um, as a black geek and black nerd. These are some other images. I look at gallery spaces and how I can transform gallery spaces into teaching spaces and using multimodal ways of thinking about hip hop. So I like when galleries uh, invite me in to come draw on their walls. <laughs> and and I'm, you know, I'm showing these prints on, on these walls as well. And then what's interesting is I can bring students in, professors will bring students in and we talk about how the space is transformed by thinking about hip hop and remix, right? What I think is very interesting about this is my commentary is very black all the time. I had to say it it's very black all the time, <laughs> right? What I think is interesting about this is no matter what, you don't scrape the paint off the wall. You actually paint over it, right? You have to return it to these very pristine white walls, for example. Right? What's interesting to me about that is imagine if there were a Trump rally there the next week, Klan rally there the next week, right? My black commentary is still up in there. The walls have absorbed my voice. They have my DNA. My black presence is still in there, arguably maybe even decades later, right? I think about that. But then I also DJ a set <laughs> in there, right? I'm an emerging DJ. I started DJing about a year and a half ago. Uh, shouts out, where's Jermaine? Where's, uh, yeah, right on. There's Jermaine in the picture too. We DJ the set together at Union College.
Um, John and I uh, think about black masculinity in very interesting ways as well. We are in our second year of a series of exhibitions that we're doing at Art Block, um, at the Culver Center, and at um, University of California, Riverside, downtown Riverside, California. And our first show was looking at Luke Cage. The title of the show was called Uncaged Hero for Hire, right? Um, and we looked at these multiple ways of thinking about um, the way that we teach. The exhibition is actually a teachable syllabus. You can actually teach the exhibition, right? There's, there's a book list, there's um, these 10-week these prompts, right, that allow you to teach this gallery, actually this exhibition, um, in the classroom. And it's for many age groups. But we're looking at the complexities of, of black masculinity, right? Um, using a lot of uh, quotes from Harlem-based um, artists like Mace, for example, if you think I'm something sweet, taste me how much you really want it. <laughs> right? Enough to put a mill on it or your deal on it, right? Um, I'm looking at Luke Cage because he's created, he's actually created as a prison experiment, right? Um, so then I'm, I'm looking at germ warfare and thinking about that in reference to the black body. But I'm also looking, about, uh, looking at this very sensual, um, you know, shiny body, naked Luke Cage as well. Right, and the, the ideas of coffee. Coffee is a metaphor, if you've not seen. <laughs> Jermaine, you know what the coffee is? <laughs> or Robin's like, no, she's like, I know what the coffee is. So I'm looking at the complexity of, uh, we are both looking at the complexity of black masculinity um, in, these, in these ways. Even a very simple abstraction, right, cartoon of a very powerful, one of the strongest and most invulnerable characters in the Marvel Universe. So uh, test time right now. How many of you have seen Luke Cage, the Netflix series? What is Luke Cage's power? Bulletproof. He's bullet. Who said that? That's it. Oh, Jermaine with the deep voice in the front. <laughs> is that really a superpower? That's interesting. How do you prove Luke Cage's superpower? <laughs> you have to shoot him, right? Going into the second season, there, it opens up with him walking into a room. He's like, come on. All right, you have to see if the myth is true. It's an urban legend that he's unkillable. What other urban myths about black men you have to see if the myth is true? <laughs> ha! <laughs> Me, Ray, stop it. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm looking at this, even this Q-tip lyric off the Renaissance album where he says, I'm the Luke Cage of the Loose Leaf page. Right, as a text and design project. Or this very Romare Beard inspired abstraction, right, that looks at black joy. While we have to maintain black joy with our hands up. It gets deep real quick, y'all. Our second show that's up right now is uh, called Reflection Eternal, and it looks at Candyman. How many of you know the 1992? Yeah, Candyman, yeah, right? So we're looking at. Um, Black masculinity again, but these through horror, right? And how many of you know these references right here? Some of. Uh, Woo! Come <laughs> on now. Sweet stick thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, for Dan so Daniel Ropatai is an artist, a black male artist who is hired to paint his muse. Um, pardon me, is hired to paint um, a very prestigious person in the community, white person in the community, his daughter. And he falls in love with his muse. And because of that, Brittany, you see that? Yeah, because of that, he's killed. But his hand is chopped off as well. He's a painter, right? So it's this additional punishment. But it also looks at um, and thinks about body parts. Many times where black men and women were hung, right, mm -hmm. they would cut off body parts. I want to know what they do with them penises. John and I write stories and think about that. I have a whole story thinking about what they're doing with black penises. Mm -hmm. That's for real. It might sound comical, but it's not really comical, right? I'm also looking at um, spaces that exist through lyrics, right? Exist in a black imagination, um, I, so, but through remix. So you have the Star Wars Death Star, which I remix to think about the most Death Star, <laughs> <laughs> right? As a, and in the rings of this black planet, this Saturn planet is a record that spins on beat, right? I have a whole narrative where, where actually the beat is dropped by Grand Wizard Theodore, 
right? We invented the needle drop, right? But I'm also looking at MF Doom and the remix of this rapper. How many of you know who MF Doom is? He was uh, uh, a rapper who came out in the mi uh, early 90s under the name Zev Love X, right? Under, with a group called KMD. Their album was shelved by the company, supposedly got leaked. He went underground and reemerged as a new artist called MF Doom. MF stands for a number of different things. <laughs> Mama, exactly what it stands for, which I'm not going to say. <laughs> metal face, metal fingers, other things as well, right? But he remixed his origin using Marvel Comics records, right? So imagine, imagine he's, he's using these Marvel Comics records and sampling them to tell his origin about what happened to him in the music industry and how he's coming out to take revenge on the music industry. He's a performance artist as well. He will send imposters to his show dressed as himself as an entire commentary about how people go to shows to see the artists and how good the artists look, but they don't care about the artist's commentary. What's more important, my lyrics or how I look? Mm, ma, can I drop one on them, <laughs> right? This piece, I'm, I'm, once again, I'm looking at, but I'm also looking at black deities, black gods, creating our own gods, tapping into our ancestral culture, right? Um, and then what are those gods? What do they look like through our own imagining? So for here, for example, I'll talk about this piece. Um, and my pieces are propaganda posters. I think that it's very important for my art to be simply understood. Um, my, one of my inspirations, Emery Douglas, has a manifesto that talks about what black art should do. And in that, one of the things he says is black art should be so easy to interpret that a child can understand it. I believe that my work is very easy for you to grasp something from. This, uh, so this piece is called Decolonizing the Black Imagination. It's really simple. It's a black fist running out of a black woman's mind, right? But then I'm also making this piece I call, um, this is called We Got Next. And it's a character called Saturn Boy, which is standing in a b-boy stance, making a declaration. How many of you know what we got next means? It's a term shouted out on the basketball court. Show up with your crew, you shout out we got next to the, the two crews, uh, to two teams that are playing on the court pre at the current time. Whoever wins, your crew is going to play them. Here's how important this declaration is. If you don't shout that out in time and another crew shows up, they say we got next, the code of the streets is they beat you to it. It's almost like calling shotgun when you want to sit in the front seat, right? I remember doing that as a teenager. <laughs> Some people were calling shotgun in the house. I'm like, come on, there's a code to this. You got to wait till you get outside at least. <laughs> but, but this Saturn B-boy is shouting out a declaration that I don't, honestly don't have memorized. He's talking about we got next and defining um, our education. We got next in defining our image. We got next in defining how we're um, where we live at, right, et cetera. There's an entire declaration I wrote about what we have next as black people in defining. More images of these black deities. I remember my best friend and I would discuss what do black angels look like. Like we would be reading the Bible and looking at these images and like we don't see ourselves in there. How can I, how, if I'm not in there, what does that mean? So I start, I'm, as an artist, I would make images of, of black gods, angels, deities, whatever. I don't consider it blasphemous. But it's all inspired by hip hop, right? So this, um, um, this, this piece, uh, what is this piece called? I forgot what that piece is called. <laughs> um, I forgot what that piece is called. But it, it's a messenger, it's an angel, it's a messenger, it's a hip hop angel, right? This piece is called the Harbinger. I'm looking at black utopian spaces. These are works in progress. These are things I'm figuring out, thinking about. These are not even near done. But I'm looking at spaces like Dr. King's mountaintop in the promised land, right? He said, I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I've seen it. This is right before he passed. But he leaves that with us. He's seen it. If he's seen it, we're going to take him into the future, but we're also going to take his imagination into the future, right? So what does that mountaintop look like? What does Prince's erotic city look like? What does Tupac's thug's mansion or I wonder if heaven got a ghetto look like, right? even looking at this idea of black death as our escape, right? And, to the, and I want to look at, I want to get to the point where we don't have to look at the sweet by and by to see our promised land. I'm also looking at other utopias, like, two, I mean, like uh, Outcast Stankonia, 
right? Uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire is the twelfth of Never. Stevie Wonder's As, where he's talking about black love and how long it will last until eight times eight times eight is what? Four. Four. To when dolphins fly and parrots live at sea. (laughs) Y'all, woo, (laughs) right? Um, But I'm also looking at some of these darker, um, we, we tap into the light a lot and thinking about utopia, but I wanna tap into our dark. I wanna know what those, um, why do we consider non-Christian, non-white belief systems, dark, pagan, negative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm illustrating, I illustrated this piece for a science fiction writer, Linda Addison, and it's a spell for the black speculative art movement. It's a spell that I illustrated. John and I make a lot of, like I said, we make a lot of work. This is our first comic together. It's called Kid Code and the Everlasting Cosmic Mixtape. It's about an intergalactic time traveler who's seeking the voice of God that was stolen, broken, and remixed by an entity called the power, right? Who uses the voice of God um, to bring chaos to the universe. Kid Code and his team uh, with Father Time and Roxy Clockwise are seeking these shards of God's voice throughout uh, the galaxy so that they can reassemble it and reset and reset the universe. We also have another comic called Night Boy, which follows uh, um, Jamal Jemison, who is um, he is a teen, an artistic teen with dyslexia. His dyslexia is part of his superpower. He's actually a, a character that created himself into existence from his own sketchbook. I want you to think about that. That's, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that, right? But the way that the dyslexia works is he can see a hidden world that we can only see in the margins between the panels of the comic book. Through these panels, these creatures emerge who steals kids, adults, people from Buffalo. Jamal Jemison as Night Boy is a defender of the Buffalo Knight, whose power is actually shadows. There's a, a level of depth to that, the idea of, of your black shadow having power, right? I'm a graphic designer, so one of the things I was tasked with is to come up with a logo for the Black Speculative Arts Movement. The Black Speculative Arts Movement is a movement that is happening right now under the um, uh, guidance of uh, Ronaldo Anderson and other people. We are traveling internationally thinking about black speculative culture and, and conversation with, the cu- with current and, spec- and politics, how we're thinking about them in the future. right? So I'm, the, I am one of the designers for the black speculative arts movement. It's important that I bring my traditional skills into thinking about um, defining our own space as well. And these are many of the countries that we've gone to or we are going to. I'm gonna talk about this really quickly. So, and actually I'll talk about this later, but John and I are the art editors for a, a publication imprint out of Ohio State University called New Sons. That is an imprint that looks at black speculative culture. It's an academic press. So these are some of the images that we've created together. The Ancient Futures logo, um, Planet Deep South, which I already talked about. Black Mao I'll talk about later. And then then there's this new journal that's coming out out of Russ College called the Journal of Black Speculative, um, the Journal of the Black Speculative Arts Movement, called Mojo. These are some images of comics that I created. I like to show. I like to show off. I can make a lot of art. This is colorful history. This this is a two-page comic about um, Wink's Lodge, which was a resort, a black resort that was built by a couple because black kids could not play at the YMCA. And um, I was commissioned to write. write uh, com- no, I didn't write it. I illustrated. I was commissioned to do this, and. Um, I was like, yeah, this is a black utopian space, and this is the way I think about it. Yes, absolutely, I'll draw this. I lend my work to covers as well, to book covers. So Apex Magazine used one of my images that was dealing with the black zodiac. Um, Obsidian uh, Journal um, used a few of my pieces, actually, for the front and back cover. And supposedly, this is the highest selling of all their journals, which has been in want to say what 40 something years this, uh, pub- this publication has, has been around I'm not sure I could totally have that wrong 
Um, but I lended a piece also to a pedagogy, I mean curriculum and pedagogy um, journal as well. So these are covers that John and I did for the New Sons imprint. These are the first four books that we were able to um, uh, design. We designed the covers for them, the front and back covers. Man, these look great together. I just I could look at these all day. I'm very proud that that we are chosen to kind of define the artistic look of a a, a movement. Collaboration is very important with uh, to me. I, this year, I was able to brand a really good friend of mine, Ruth Nicole Brown, um, who um, her Black Girl Genius Week, and she travels uh, around the country bringing hip hop um, and culture and ways of thinking about this to black girls. And I was like, you sure you want me to do this? She was like, oh, yes, I definitely want to work with you. I was like, I could get you like some women artists. She was like, no, I want to work with you. I was, I was very honored to be able to add my voice to this. And she I had, obviously I had to make sure she liked it. Black Mal is a collaboration between um, D, a DJ and visual artist Kamal Grantham. Uh, we've, what's interesting about this is we, we've lived in a lot of the same places at the same time. <laughs> we both lived in Albany, New York at the same time, and I'm, we're like, I was like, we probably met each other back in the day. But he also lived in Buffalo in New York City, as I did, and we both live in Champaign-Urbana right now. He's my DJ mentor, one of three DJ mentors. But he's also a collage artist. And we, um, we, were, doing, we were playing with this project that looks at our overlaps and thinking about Afrofuturism, Afrocentrism, and music through collage. So he starts the project, and I add to it and converse with it. Right, that's a, very t that's a very different way that I'm used to collaborating, but it's been working and people love it. This is, these are um, pieces that I illustrated for um, the Black and Brown Futures Conference that took place two years ago at, um, oh my goodness, was, uh, <laughs> uh, University of Texas at San Antonio. This was a commi uh, commission by uh, Kenitra Books, Brooks, who was a fellow last year. These are other pieces that I've used. So this piece right here um, took place, this was a piece for a conference in Oakland. So I looked at the Black Panther Party in conversation with the Black Panther, Marvel's Black, and Netflix, um, pardon me, Marvel Comics and Marvel uh, Studios Black Panther, which uh, the Black Panther character is created only a few months after the Black Panther Party. It's so close that the history is actually kind of reversed sometimes. Uh, these are some future projects I'm working on. I'm gonna close out talking about some future projects um, that I'm, I want am I doing this for fun? Kind of as I'm doing this for fun. Uh, I started drawing on the iPad, iPad Pro. And I'm looking at making, I'm a DJ, right? So I'm gonna start owning that. And I'm looking at creating vinyl and slip mats that go into records. Those slip mats go into the records so you don't scratch up your record on a turntable, right? But I wanna make these Afrofuturist pieces um, that look at a black couple as a son, or this cluster um, of black star babies, or um, this black moon, right, uh, of black men, right? And thinking about this and, and looking at what do I wanna say, how I wanna think about this, but also how my art will spin in the cypher. Whew, yeah, so. <laughs> um, after this talk, I'll be able to get back to some work, <laughs> right? I'm, uh, another project that I'm looking, on it, looking at is something I'm calling Rhyme Capsule. It's looking at these, um, it's looking at these two worlds. Nothing really genius there, one upper world, one lower world. The upper world is actually built on the elements and principles of hip hop that were stolen and kept, this knowledge was stolen and kept to keep the underworld in an underclass. Right, so this, this, under, this underworld finds the keys to my studio. Why is it my studio? Because inside my studio literally is how I theorize hip hop. It's my books, it's my DJ equipment, it's my artwork, it's the collaborative space that I bring people in to have the weightier conversations that we can't necessarily have in public spaces, right? So I imagine my studio um, survives uh, uh, the, the apocalypse and these kids find my keys in the capsule that was dropped from the upper world. And um, as they find the keys, they have to venture into the layers of my studio. Now my studio is not multiple levels, I wish it, it, it was not that grand, 
But as they're going throughout my studio, they're unearthing the elements of hip hop and they're learning the history of hip hop that they can actually use to reimagine their world. This is a book project. I'm, t I'm telling this publicly. It's all going to be on public, but this, uh, uh, made publicly. But this is a book that I plan to pitch to my uh, to my agent. I'm also looking at um, black astronauts. Q-tip pissed me off. <laughs> the last last Tribe Called Quest album. I hadn't heard the album as soon as it came out, but people kept texting me and quoting the same thing. There ain't no space program for black people. Nigga, you stuck here. I was, woo, I was hot. Mama, I, I promise you I dropped a few that day. I was hot. And I was like, why do people keep sending me this? I thought they were dissing my work, right? Then I listened to the album and I understood the commentary. And I was like, wow, I understand this commentary about us feeling stuck here when we cannot escape colonialism or we feel, we feel that we cannot escape. So I started looking at black astronauts. I was like, let me look up black astronauts, right? Let me also think about this traveling to space while, and, and the ideas and the contentions of traveling to space while there's political protest that's happening right here on Earth. There's, there's some contention that I could imagine there, right? So I started making these design pieces, these abstractions. These are not done either. But I started looking at uh, Mae Jemison, right? as who was interesting as first black woman astronaut, but also who became an actor, actress on the Star Trek uh, Next Generation series, who was inspired by Nichelle Nichols. She became an astronaut because of Star Trek. I'm also looking at Jeanette Epps. So um, one of the things I'm really proud of as I'm researching Jeanette Epps, she's an astronaut now. I'm looking at as she's thinking, you know, going into space, what's happening? at this current time, Trump era, uh, politics, et cetera, as she's going into space. I presented this with an astronaut one time. I presented this in front of an astronaut. Can't remember my man's name. I hope he doesn't see this, <laughs> right? Um, as, he, as I showed this slide, he took a picture of it and he texted to Jeanette, uh, Jeanette Epps. And he came up to me afterward. He said, hey, I want to let you know that slide you showed, uh, Jeanette Epps, yeah, she's a really good friend of mine. I just want to let you know she loves your work. I'm like, what? <laughs> Astronauts is checking out my Afrofuturist for real? OK, yo, woo, right? I, I got amped, right? Woo, we. But there ain't no space program for black people. What do we, what do, we do with that? That's where my art begins to, to look at. So Mark Derry coined this term in 1993, Afrofuturism. And he's looking at these, uh, these aesthetics, this movement that is happening around this popular culture and black people creating ourselves into these other things beyond blackness. And he says, for lack of a better term, we'll call it Afrofuturism. I actually love the term. I have issues with the definition, but I love the term. Right? The term really looks at the aesthetics, but not really the why behind the aesthetics. Right? Why are we black aliens, black robots? Why are we trying to escape this planet right, and go to other places where white people don't exist? Why is that happening? Why are we constantly making this narrative, right? My work looks at that. that so for that lack of a better term, that's where my, my work takes off. I'm also looking at um, this project I'm calling hip, Make Hip Hop Great Again. Uh, <laughs> that looks at the notions of peace, love, unity, and having fun, right? Um, and these ideas of youth, cu youth culture as well. Thinking about when do black kids get to be kids? When do they get to be able to have their imagination, play in a park without police rolling up and killing them? Being able to play at a pool party, being able to have a cookout without neighbors calling the cops on them, being able to sleep on a couch in college without, being, without the police being called on them, right? When do we get to be, and at 47, I still want to call myself a kid. I have not grown up yet. Right? But I'm looking at hip hop culture and thinking about this. For example, this image here of this girl in this b-boy stance, I collage Voltron, which is taking it back to my 1980s, 80s love of, 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 of um, manga and Japanese animation. Um, but this little girl, anybody recognize her face? Uh, wasn't she in like the commercial? She was in the Cheerios commercial. <laughs> She was, a, she was a girl. How many of you remember the Cheerios commercial with the interracial couple, the black man and white woman? You remember the controversy behind that? Right? 
right? So, the, so for those of you who are unaware, there's a scene between a mother and daughter. They're eating Cheerios on screen, right? But when they shoot, go to the father, he's not in the scene. They go to him, and he's laying on the couch. Now, I thought about this. This man tired. He taking care. This is a black man taking care of his family. However, when a black man is tired and laying down, he's never just a black man tired and laying down. Come on, right? So I looked at this and think about this. I'm bringing this political commentary into popular culture, remixing this and thinking about this, right? Um, I'm looking at this, this Jack Kirby image of this literally a black fist rising out of the cosmos. You know what book that's from, John? I don't even know what book that's from. That black fist rising out of the cosmos? Oh, I think so too. I think you're right. But I imagine this as this young black kid's mind. But I'm also looking at the contentions between Dr. King and Malcolm X. Right, and when Malcolm comes back from Mecca, he's talking about he's talking about how he's going to work with King, and I wanted to, always wanted to see that history. Right, unfortunately, we did not get to see this, but I'm comparing this to um, the Autobot and Decepticon cyber war, uh, I mean, the civil war that's happening on Cybertron. Right, I'm thinking about this and looking at um, our pol the political, right, but also the pop cultural. Closing out, I'm going to talk about these drawings I did on an iPad as kind of these cool downs that, um, <laughs> I love these y'all. So I'm creating an entire body of work that's looking at hip hop samples. Part of the reason why I'm here is to mine the, um, the hip hop archives here, right? And to really look at, I've been collecting records for like 30 years, y'all. And um, my love of jazz, blues, funk, soul, et cetera, a lot of that comes from my mom and my aunt. Shouts out to my mom and my aunt in the, in the audience here who played these records as we were cleaning the house on Saturday morning, right? What's interesting about this is I'm going to talk about these original samples is many of my favorite DJs have the same story. Their parents came from the South. M um, dad might have liked blues. Krishna, am I on time? Am I good? Am I Two more minutes. I will be done in two more minutes. Um, with mom, dad might have liked blues. Mom might have liked soul. They bring they bring up their records, for example, right? Um, and then these young DJs are stealing their parents' records to create hip hop. I find this very very interesting. It's like this is exactly what I'm kind of doing, taking my family's records, <laughs> right? So I'm making these pieces. Um, this uh, Black Thought image, for example, this Dizzy Gillespie image, this uh, Youssef Latif image. But I'm making these images um, of, of and looking at the original samples that hip hop artists use, and I'm making art projects from them. So the Shaka Khan, Fela Kute, Rakim Allah, and Roy Ayers. I could look at these all day. Right? These are what I'm doing to kind of relax and think about this work, though. And Pete Rock who sampled um, Ahmad Jamal, I Love Music, exactly at the five minute mark, to create the sample for The World Is Yours by Nas, right? But I'm also looking at uh, remixing like, like uh, Nas's uh, Illmatic cover and how Marvel Comics used this to think about Miles Morales, right? Um, and then I'm looking at this Stillmatic album cover, but look, now notice this, right? And look at what I'm thinking about doing with it. So Nas has this lyric where he says, Nas is like the Afrocentric Asian, half man, half amazing. Amazing Spider-Man, right? So I'm taking this image from the Stillmatic album cover and dropping it in to kind of mimic um, this Spider-Man number one cover, right? To think about uh, Nas as the Afrocentric Asian. What does that mean to be um, a black rap Spider-Man? And what does that mean, right? Thank you, and we'll close out with a shout out to MF Doom. Thank you. Thank you, y'all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, y'all. Uh oh, Bakari about to. <laughs> Shouts out to Bakari Kitchwana. He right. is on uh, the other Nas fellow uh, with me this year. Offices <laughs> next to each other. Yes, we talk through the wall. We do, we of, do. Uh, Those walls are very thin. Closed. The walls are <laughs> mad thin. 
I'm zipping up my zipper to leave the office. He's like, Bakari, you about to leave? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah where you going? <laughs> I heard you zip up your pants, brother. Where you going? <laughs> um, this is fascinating to me. I think you did an excellent job, first and foremost. But what I want to ask you is, um, one, uh, um, I, I, I see the hip hop connections very strongly. Yeah. Um, I wonder how much you're t you, how much are you emphasizing the hip hop mm -hmm. as you're moving into this uh, Afrofuturism space for yeah. people who aren't as hip hop? Yeah. Because I, because my concern is that the hip hop is we'll being get lost. lost. It ain't lost on you because it's you. So it's coming out of everything right. that you do. And John, it comes out of you guys. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first things I noticed about John. He was so hip hop. Right, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. But like intrinsically. Mm -hmm. But I'm just mm -hmm. kind of curious about that. Yeah, so thank you for that question. So I'm always thinking about hip hop as I'm building this. It's also my nostalgia of hip hop. So it's not necessarily the entire culture of hip hop and every single rapper, every single break dancer, et cetera. It's really connected to my nostalgia of it. Um, one of my goals here is to actually spend time theorizing my work. My theory is in my head. The books that I'm referencing, they're in my head, but there's so much I haven't read and there's so much I haven't written. But I'm at a point in my career now where actually people are really citing my work, they're, they're hiring me to make projects, et cetera, and I'm like, I need to write this stuff down before somebody misquotes me and says, oh, this is a Eurocentric take on the such and such. They're like, no, that ain't what my work is about. <laughs> right, and I gotta get high pitch on them. So, this is what I'll be working on this year because I understand, I know exactly what you mean. It's not lost on me, it's not lost to people who necessarily know the culture, but everybody didn't raise their hand when I was asking these questions. This is why I have to write this stuff down. Yeah, who's next? Yes, what's up, my man? So the thing that you said earlier, like you said this a little bit earlier about this question about can the black artist make or break the divide? I, you're gonna challenge me on that, right? No, I'm sorry, <laughs> I wanna ask you about it. Yeah. Because it's like you asked that question, yeah. Yeah. Sebastiano was asked once, like, yep. you know, what's it like being a black artist? Yep. He said, you know, have you ever asked a white artist that? Exactly. And so, like, you know, yeah. or, or were you dealing with Peter? Right, right, right. Just like, you're, you're dealing with the idea of two different making, making work. Yep. Are we seeing, like, like, this can't be just for two. This got to mm -hmm. be the representation of slavery. Absolutely. Know? And there's yeah. this whole, this whole, mm -hmm. like, this whole idea mm -hmm. about, like, if you make something yeah. in America and you're black, does that mean that some yeah. can't? The politic is connected to that, right? <laughs> this is why I call that, so you remember when I said that earlier? and I said I'm constantly in failure of that, I don't know how to make work that is non-objective, that is not political. Because when I do that, the work, I don't like the work, but also, it doesn't, because it doesn't mean anything to me, I'm not connected to it. There's something about an artist being connected to the work. I consider that a failure. I don't think that black artists can actually make work that is not connected to a politic, right? However, I would love to be wrong in that because I think that racism and white supremacy have unfairly chosen the black artist practice, you know? But I would love to be proven wrong. We could debate that, please. I, ha I don't have to be right. I wanna have a conversation about this. Yes, who had the mic? Dr. West, yes sir. Oh, I just wanna uh -oh. salute you, my dear brother. Oh, oh I wanna <laughs> salute you. And your mother too, wh wh where is your mother? Where is she? Let's give it up for his mother. Yeah. Oh, yes, you can see. Oh, you got a whole lot to be proud of, my dear sister. No, absolutely. But, the, uh, but two, two quick points and then a question. Because mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right about protest. But remember now, protest ca comes from the Latin protestare, mm -hmm. which is taking a stand. Mm -hmm. It's not over against. That's not the first move. See, when you love your mama and somebody's treating her unfairly, you take a stand. That's protest. Yes, sir. But the love is prior. Yes, sir. But it, it's the white normative gaze that tries to convince us that we just over against rather than standing for something. Right. That's very important. Yes, sir. And it's, it's at work in exactly what Brother John and, and, and you all are doing at such a high high level. Really, it's just magnificent. But I, and I was thinking about Sun Ra, I was thinking about <coughs> Cold Trains and Estrella Space and the mothership of Clinton and so yes, forth. Sir. But my question is a very direct one, which is, in some sense, for both of y'all, what do you all actually see when you see black liberation? I'm gonna be honest, I struggle with that. I mean, we're all struggling with yeah, it. We, we're struggle struggling together on this. Yeah, but what do we really see concretely? Yeah. What kind of economic system? What kind of politics? Yes. How do we relate to one another? Yes. What is the relation to our grandmamas yep. and granddads? How do we relate to our kids? Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
So <laughs> you're, you're, <laughs> thank you so much. You're getting into a lot of the next stages of my work that will look at defining the laws, what, what laws govern the Afro future, right? Um, I, I'm thinking about those same things because these cannot just simply be images, right? They have, to, they have to transcend that to look at, okay, how do we build and govern a space, right? Um, and these are some of the things I want to look at while I'm here. It's, it's, it's not something I'm burst in, but it is something that is on my mind. And now that you know, I have 10 months away from teaching, I actually can spend more time in the library, spend more time across campuses and other places to have these conversations with people who are more versed in the ideas of govern government, for example. I'm thinking about that a lot, right? Especially at 47, and I know I'm leaving this world to my children and potentially my grandchildren, right? Mm -hmm. What, how am I using my art to actually push this conversation, to, but to actually build an Afro future? Because the, top, the topic is called building the Afro future. I start with the decolonized black imagination, but after we start to imagine the, the potential of this, now we gotta think about, okay, so how do we govern this space? How, is this, how do we actually think about the, the physical building of this space? I am thinking about that. I don't have the answers, I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And shouts out to my mom and my aunt, yeah, absolutely, you're sitting here. And my great-grandmother, who raised me for the first seven years of my life. Right, this work comes from black women, y'all. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, I saw it. Uh, hey, man, how you doing? Tim Fielder, what's uh, going uh, on, my uh, man? <laughs> my homie, So, out. So I uh, so, uh, wanted to ask about the cool-down images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because yeah. those are the things you've been sending as yep. of late. Uh, the one of the things that I'm struck by is how detailed they are, mm -hmm. which is why your idea, notion of it being cool down is absurd, yeah, exactly. but, <laughs> right, right. But what I wanted to do was ask you, when you were embedding that detail into your work, right, uh, I understand the context of, of applying uh, political thought to it, mm -hmm. but I wanted to know what is it that you're doing when you're applying that level of detail and what are you trying to achieve? I mean, as a person who does detail work myself, yeah. I, I'm in awe of that, so I just wanted to get uh, uh, some feedback from you on that. Yeah, um, that's a good question, because the work comes out of me, and I, it's like I imagine that I have to get it out as an artist. For those of you who are artists in the room, you might understand, you have to get this work out of you. I call it exercising and exercising, right? You got to put, you got to put it to work, but you also got to, you got to exercise it, right? Because it'll drive you crazy, right? Um, I'm not, the, the level of detail is because it allows me to relax, right? It's the graffiti, it's the, the carving out of the black space inside the images that allows me to relax and think about that um, through ideas of black abstraction. Um, I don't necessarily have an answer beyond that, necessarily. It just feels right, so I do it. Um, yes. This, this, is, this is on. Um, you know, as I look at everything, it just reminds me that when I first started thinking about the hip hop archive, the issue for me was that if I look back at jazz, if you look back at the history of African American music and art or creativity, there's this sense that this creativity is not at a high ideological or philosophical level. Mm -hmm. That is that we're not actually thinking about these things as big questions. Mm -hmm. We're surviving. Right. And so much in African American culture is the combination. It's not as though we aren't surviving, but the whole idea is to, to, to use creativity mm -hmm. to really in draw or, or formulate uh, um, a reality Absolutely. that really works. So my question for you, uh, for you is how do you approach that combination mm -hmm. of the story behind the drawing and, and, and sort of what's the progression that, that you use for that? Because so many kids really relate to it and mm -hmm. intuitively they seem to really get what's going on. And um, you're a product of you know, history, politics, mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. parents who really made sure you understood what the world was, is like and could be. And mm -hmm. so how does that end up as How does it end up work? as this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you ask me big questions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting because I don't know how not to make the work about that or to access the work through that. 
um, when I'm reading and thinking about it, um, when someone's telling me a story, I see the art through panels. Like I actually see when people are telling me something that they're reading, I see it drawn out. So I don't, um, I've always been like that. I, I don't know. Um, I have to create the work that looks at that though and thinks about that in this particular way. Most people would not, but I will say what I find very interesting is I actually pull on my past, right? So there are things that the artists who came before me did. For example, John Jennings pioneered the field that I'm in. Imagine my best friend pioneered it. And before I met him, I thought I was gonna have to learn how to do this myself. The analogy I use is that John walked through the jungle, cutting down all the vines, kicking the snakes out the way, right? And stepping on the scorpions. I actually get to the walk through the jungle and smell those flowers that are probably poisonous, or, or look at these trees, <laughs> right, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I get to enjoy the jungle while I pioneer a particular path for the next generation. Do you see what I'm saying? So I pull on that. I, I, I have no problem shouting out the people that came before me. Like, I did not get here by myself. It was my mother. It was my aunt. It was my great-grandmother who raised me for the first seven years of my life who got me into art who got me into talk radio, country music, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, who got me watching late night movies and animation. When I was a child, I studied animation frame by frame, right? I'm a kid and I was absorbing all this information. At 47, you're seeing what happened in the first seven years of my life. Shouts out to the black women who raised me, y'all, seriously. I mean, my mother always says she could never put me on punishment by sending me to my room because that's where I always wanted to go anyway, right? Because this stuff was in me. This stuff was in me as a young person, right? Thank you. I spend a lot of time on punishment, too. Like, oh, wait. But I hope that answers your question, but it's, it's a lot more complex than that. Maybe I should be writing more about that, you know, in this, this next nine months. Oh, I'll be shorter with the, with the answers then, too. That was amazing. That I'm biased, you, but that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, my man. Um, yeah, really quickly, yet, um, Brother West, you, you brought up a really uh, excellent point. I think a lot of the answers, there's no like pat answers, of course, there's a series of answers. Um, as, wi as Richard Buchanan states, we are in not in just one problem, it's a, it, we're, it's a series of what he calls wicked problems. Yeah. Because once you take a problem out, another one replaces, it's like a hydra, you know. So it's going to take a lot of us working on those wicked problems way past our natural lifespan. And I think um, now that I'm a father, you know, uh, um, three months and some change in, you know, the Afro future means a very different thing to me right now, you know. So I'm trying to basically. His name is Jackson Kirby, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. My God, son, y'all. Yeah. So, so that's one thing. So, so the narratives that I'm trying to create, the, the work that I'm trying to create, hopefully that young brother will be able to, to take it into right. the Afro future as well mm -hmm. because we're not going to solve it in our lifetime. I don't think right. so. I don't the think so either. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's cool though. That's you know, so just making me try like to leave. We've seen it. Right, right. Yeah. The other thing, I really quickly, want to state is that the w I think the reason that those particular images get so complex is because yes, there's a generative, contemplative, relaxation to it, but also these black images, just like Candy Wiley's work, kind of focuses on these black images are worthy of the attention and of the of the co of the care, you know, uh, of of the focus, you know. And the other thing too is that you know he's always finding these images because the image is already there. You know, mm -hmm. it's almost like fish swimming swimming in a stream. You just want to grab the right one. That's how we work. It's ar they're already there. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to find it. You're trying to carve it out, yeah. and a lot and that takes time. You know, and it took him a long time to learn how to draw that. You know, so I appreciate that. That's all I want to say. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'm gonna shout out my friend Tim Fielder. You know, who said he said we deserve epic stories, right? And we were talking about the level of detail in the work that we make, and he said we deserve epic stories. Well, I found that fascinating, right? I also wanted to shout out Bettina Love. She has a book called We Want to Do More Than Survive, right? You, you talked about that earlier, about this notion of just surviving. I want that, right? I want, I want, to, see, I want to see the next generation take this work and remix it, right? And what are they, how are they going to actually think about hip hop and, re, and, and building the, the future as well? Absolutely. Who is next? Anybody? Fox, what's up, my man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not too much, no. Very, very inspired. And so thanks, first of all, just for also mentioning uh, John's son, which gives us an opportunity you know, to give our thanks and shout out to his son. Also to his wife, who has the, out to <laughs> the, 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 yeah. the kind of uh, 
spirit that you guys can come together and, and go with a name like Jackson Kirby. That pays attention to your ancestors. Our artistic ancestors. So you want to name him what now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's beautiful. Yeah, and you know, so I want to just start off with a comment and that's a segue to a question. And you answered it very, you actually made this comment in a succinct way before with Basquiat's quote, but I just wanted to tell a kind of parable that relates. So I, uh, uh, some years back I was reading a book, you know, it was an art history book called Art Today, <laughs> and it describes a few artists. So this is relating to your idea about black artists and can we do non-political work. Mm -hmm. So you, you may know the work of Sam Gilliam, the abstract yeah. expressionist. Of course, right? oh yeah. Right, and so yeah, he was famously accused of being an Uncle Tom by African American militants mm -hmm. for doing this kind of work. He says, I just want to be an artist, not a black right. artist. The book also describes Alison Sarr's uh, work and here, it, uh, and it's a white art editor of the book who describes that uh, she seems to be self-conscious in bringing into, into existence a kind of primitivism that does not come about spontaneously for her, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so this is, again, looking at her drawing upon her influences mm -hmm. you know, from you know, di the diaspora and back from Africa I itself and, and the many cultures there. And then Martin Purrier, he, they describe him somewhere in between, right? Yeah, as this, yeah that he's one of the, you know, quote unquote, the few African-American artist who has direct experience of Africa. So, uh, and, uh, and so he's kind of in between the, t the three, or uh, between the other two. Mm -hmm. So the reason I bring it up is because regardless of those stances, they're in the second to last chapter of the book under the racial minorities mm -hmm. <laughs> heading, <laughs> right? So that's no matter what stance you take, you're put into this yeah, chapter. Yeah, there's nothing right. minor, minor about the people who occupy most of the planet uh, right, who, the, who, the, who the, the jump-started mankind and civilization. Right, I mean, the, la I mean the, other, the other chapters being art British figurative painting and things at this fine right, kind of grain. Right. The last section being feminist and gay, which is also mm -hmm. another story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so I, I just mention uh, this because I see you as, uh, and John is doing something which is a kind of remedy to the situation, which is you're creating the kind of spaces, you know, besides yeah. utopia, heterotopia, the kind of alternate spaces in which you can actually define your own chapters, your own right. structure. You know, that, that's what you said at the beginning. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you're creating these kind of spaces that you can live in this kind of dialogue, yeah. uh, whether yeah, it's yeah. on the day-to-day, week-to-week uh, basis, where you're actually rewriting the order of this kind of yeah. book, and then you're creating the kind of space in which a Sam Gilliam or an Alison Saar can do the kind of work that they want Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I would love to talk about that briefly. Yeah, so <laughs> one, one of the things, um, as an emerging DJ, um, as somebody who is so in love with, with hip hop, and really looking at the elements as a, an epistemology, as a foundation, right, um, and building a future society. And I have to do a lot of writing about this, you all, in the next several months. Um, one of the things I do is I transform gallery spaces. So I'm an, ex an exhibition artist. You know, I exhibit in galleries what would be considered fine art, even though the work I make is digital, right? So I'm challenging that in a particular way. But I frame my exhibitions around the elements of hip hop, my work being the graffiti on the wall, right? My, um, my artist talk being the emceeing, et cetera. I always have a dance party involved with that. And I DJ the set. So I control the, the, the sound of the temporary utopia of the gallery space. We get together um, for imagine a, a gallery, imagine a gallery exhibition on a Friday night from, from five to eight, six to nine, et cetera. We come in and we are always trying to push that. And I've had shows go to 11, past 11 o'clock. People don't want to leave the temporary utopia, y'all, that's framed by hip hop. This is what I do inside the gallery space, right, as a particular type of practice. Now, um, the other thing I do is I invite the marginalized community that never gets invited to any art show. They don't come, it's, it's, they don't ac access the work, it's not about them, they say this, I don't come because the work ain't about me. I invite them to the gallery space specifically to converse with the gallery patrons that paid for my show, that are paying me, right, that, um, that sponsored the exhibition. These two audiences would never converse at any other time except for inside this temporary utopia from six to eight that we push to 11. The other thing I do, which is very critical, is I, invite the activist community who can help facilitate the conversation that the work that the hip hop is, is talking about between these two audiences that don't know, wouldn't necessarily know how to converse with each other. This takes a lot of planning, y'all. 
So during a week long, many times a week long residency that I'm doing at the gallery, what I also do is I set up with the, the curator um, a workshop with children, workshops with the community when I can that bring the community out to do things like resume building, um, college applications, portfolio development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because when I leave, I want the community to be left with something very tangible from a black speculative inspiration that they can use to transform their tangible world. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, good, good, <laughs> all right. Does that address, yeah? So this is something that I'm doing as a practice, y'all, and it's very difficult. I know I said that was gonna be brief, but ooh, yeah, it's hard, y'all. <laughs> one, so, one last question? Okay, yes, hey, sir. Hey, how you doing? Vijay Iyer, Hello, music department. Um, thank you, I also wanna salute you for this incredible abundance of magnificent work. It's just so Thanks. stunning to see any piece of it, let alone all of it. It's like, it's really remarkable and I'm, oh, I'm really moved by it. Um, and I also want to salute Fox Harrell, who I haven't seen in eons, <laughs> an old friend from See, this West is a temporary Coast. utopia here, so, y'all. Um, <laughs> That's the last at question MIT. inside the temporary and, utopia. Um, <laughs> and uh, I just want to to ask you to maybe kind of continue on what you were just talking about as your experience as a DJ, which is about sound. Um, everything you've, uh, you've presented to us has been, you know, I, I want to say shockingly visual <laughs> and very abundantly um, detailed and rich. And also you quoted a lot of lyrics and literature and poetry and characters and text. Um, and I feel like when I look at this, I see you I see you listening. Yes. So I wonder if, I mean, and that to me is like the source of all that detail. And I just wonder if you could put words to that experience, yeah. both as oh, a I DJ and as a... I can absolutely do that. I have a Coltrane piece that I, I was commissioned to do for our Birchfield Penny um, a Museum um, in Buffalo, New York. I'm not a Coltrane scholar by any means, you know, um, but... When I made that piece, I could not make this piece just like I made a, a Fela piece that I'm, I'm still working on. I listen to the artist while I'm making this work because I, I have to put their spirit into the work, right? I don't know if you see that necessarily or not, but when I talk about it, if I showed this Coltrane piece, you would be able to see it, right? The way that I make work, because there's a, a DNA, a, 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 um, a sound, an auditory DNA that is in each piece. I can remember what I was listening to when I made each piece. I remember pieces that I made, I was listening to the Jay Dillard's Donut album, right, on repeat, right? Or I was listening to uh, Mad Libs Beat Conductor Volume 1, right? I was, I remember particular, um, and there's a, a, a DNA in the work that I like to think is, in, inspires how I'm making the work because th that's where it comes from. Um, what's interesting about this is that some of the next stages of my performance practice, because this really is a performance, multimodal performance practice, really trying to unite these elements of hip hop in the way I think about it, um, I have to get into the sound more. This is another thing that I'm looking to get into a little bit more here. Yes, I'm mining the hip hop archives here on campus, but I'm also to looking to understand how, and this is gonna be years of research, but how sound actually affects the body. Because we know that we know that sound affects the body, right? We know that. That's that's not. A, we don't have to debate that. But I want to know how can I manipulate sound to create healing inside of bodies, right? As an as an art practice, sure. But as something that's really a lot more um, tangible and maybe even more applicable, we could argue as a particular type of practice. It's a lot of work that I have ahead, I have ahead of me, and this is what I'm looking to, part of some, some of the things I'm looking to access here, even in the beginnings of having conversations, I look at that too. Absolutely, but I can't talk about all of that, you all, to talk, but it's there, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> that was the last question for real, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you all for having me. Seriously, thank you, thank you. Thank you.